Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. My name's Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic, and I'm a member of this group. So tonight, we're, we're going to finish up the doctor's opinion. We spent a couple of weeks on it so far, reading uh, especially the letters that the doctor wrote. First letter was a little short. That was and not very detailed. That came out in when the book came out, first edition, first printing. And then when the book was printed, the second printing of the first edition, the second letter was added, and it's a little more inclusive. It has a lot more stuff in it. So we've read about the fact that the doctor had brought to everyone's attention that alcoholism is a manifestation of an allergy in the body, that once we take one drink, we develop the phenomenon of craving, and then we keep on drinking, and we can't stop. So the definition of that part of an alcoholic is once you've had one drink, you cannot control your drinking, how much you're going to drink. And of course, you can't control your behavior either because people are drinking and who knows what you'll do when you're drunk. And, and it talked about how the doctor really had a hard time dealing with alcoholics. He, he didn't know how to get them to stop drinking. You know, he couldn't help with that. They just kept on drinking. He studied alcoholism enough to come up with many different kinds of alcoholics. We talked about the different kinds of alcoholics, the different types. And as we go through them, as we went through them last week, I realized I was, at some point in my drinking career, I was each and every one of those types. So I became the real alcoholic at the end that was trying to drink myself to death. So there was quite a bit about that. and and. And the doctor had said that the only way to recover was 100% complete abstinence, not one single drink, no alcohol whatsoever. That's, that will certainly keep you from getting drunk, but it was also very hard. In his experience, he found that the only way to recover was if the person had an entire psychic change, meaning they changed their psyche, changed their mind changed the way they thought about things. That's what got them over alcoholism, is changing the way they think in combination with not picking up a drink. And so when we when we learned that, we, we learned, and I, I used to hear when I first came in, guy would say to me, don't worry, you only have to change one thing, everything. And that sounded huge to me. I couldn't understand how I was going to do that. What do you mean change everything? I have a personality. I can't change my personality. Little did I know the book was going to teach me exactly how to do that. And we'll read a little bit more about that tonight. So we're starting on page 31, Roman numeral 31, which is in the doctor's opinion, which comes before the first chapter, Bill's story, which will start next week. So at the top of the page 31, it says, what is the solution? They've been looking for that for decades. Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. About a year ago, prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for al chronic alcoholism. He had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. Well, a gastric hemorrhage is internal bleeding in your stomach, your intestines, your colon, and out. So he was bleeding. Not good. And pathological mental deterioration is what they commonly call wet brain. The alcohol soaked his brain so bad that it deteriorated his brain. Some some people got wet brain and never recovered from that. And they were just mental cases. That was it. They were done. Vegetables. Put away in the asylum. Back when we had asylums like that. He's talking about a drunk who was a bad drunk. Drinking until he's bleeding from his butt and mentally messed up, where his brain is soggy. And he says he had lost 
everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. What a lonely place that must have been. Following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. 100% abstinence took away the alcohol. The guy got better. He was lucky. It says he accepted the plan outlined in this book. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but I was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. So, this is Bill Wilson. And what a change from a guy who was, they were looking at him as if he had a wet brain and he was physically burnt out by alcohol. His body was destroyed. And he had a wet brain, getting close to a wet brain, could completely recover from that and become a man of prestige, a man who looked decent, had self-confidence in, in a year. It was a complete, total change. I looked back in my life and remembered what it was like when I came in. I was really, I mean, I was very close to dying myself. And I i had given up hope. And I was going to drink myself to death was my plan. But that didn't happen. I found AA. I came into AA. And I got sober. And I am not that guy that walked in the door 21 years ago. I'm just not that guy. That I don't resemble that guy at all. Well, I don't behave the way he did. I don't think the way he did. I don't treat people the way that guy did. It's entirely different now. The change is big. And there's still changing to go. You're never done. He says, I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. So whatever happened in that hospital, finding out and accepting the plan that is outlined in this book changed this guy forever. Now remember, at that time, when he's talking about that guy, this book didn't exist. He's talking to before this book was published, he was talking about that guy. So the guy, did, you know, the book didn't exist. So he followed the plan in the book as it became a book and a plan later on. But he, he did what he had learned from other people that got sober before him. He didn't have this book like we do. So we're lucky we have a book. It goes on to say, when I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis and deciding his situation hopeless, had hidden in a deserted barn, determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party and in desperate condition brought to me. Following his physical rehabilitation, he had a talk with me in which, frankly, I stated he thought the treatment was a waste of effort unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. Willpower. This man thought that willpower, self-will, would be enough. That's why it had failed so many times, because that was what he thought, that it was willpower alone, that his willpower would be strong enough to keep him from drinking. But we know from a couple of weeks ago, when we looked at the, the cycle of self-destruction with alcoholism, that the willpower 
is strong enough to hold you off for a period of time, a short period of time. But after that, the emotions that you feel in life, anger, fear, resentment, all those things that are emotionally strong push us beyond our willpower. And we pick up a drink. And once we pick up a drink, we can't quit. So we go through the cycle of self-destruction. So somehow or another, we have to do something more than willpower. It will hold us for a while, but not long enough. So what would that be? The next paragraph says, his alcoholic problem was so complex and his depression so great that he felt his only hope would be through what he called moral psychology. And we doubted if even that would have any effect. So what is moral psychology? Well, we all know what morals are. Morals are God's laws. There's the things that are created by God. Those instincts within us. Those things that we know are good. That we know are right. You know that it's wrong to steal. Nobody has to tell you. It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to kill somebody. There's all these things that we know are wrong. And we don't do them. If we're moral people. And to have that mindset, the psychology, to always do the moral thing is something that we should aspire to. To always be moral. Always follow God's rules. But before coming into this program, we didn't know about such a thing. We didn't, we didn't follow that the way we should. We, we left our morals on the doorstep and drank. And we did stuff that we were, that we knew was not right, but we did it anyway, most of us. So we had to have this moral psychology. We had to have a change. When we started doing things because it was the right thing to do. In AA, we talk about do the next right thing. So what's the next right thing? First of all, we have to consider what's the next wrong thing, because that's usually what we went to in our lives before AA. We would do things that we knew were wrong, but we did them anyway. So we had to find out a new way of doing things. What was the better way? We learned in AA to pray. You know, my first meeting, I walked into the very first meeting, and the very first thing I said was the serenity prayer. So the first word I ever said in AA was, God, grant me the serenity. And that was the first time that I had appealed to a power greater than myself to give me anything, to calm me down. I was a mess then. And at the end of that meeting, we said another prayer. You know, and every day we were praying. I was going to meetings and praying twice a day. That was two more times than I'd ever prayed before. So I, you know, the the idea of doing something for moral reasons came to me in AA, not before. So I learned a lot of that stuff here and have continued learning that stuff. Moral psychology. And that's a big change. That changes a person from what they used to be to what they are now. You know, that's a big change. That changes every aspect of our lives. How we treat our family, how we treat people that we work with, how we treat people that we play with, you know, the people that we run into in our lives, how we treat other people, how we are considerate of other people, how we're, you know, loving, kind, tolerant, patient, understanding, all those principles that we learn in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous are spiritual principles related to God's morals. And we start to practice those morals in our everyday life with other humans that we had never done before. We learned the morals right here in this program. And as these men who were so down learned those morals, their life got better and they stopped drinking. They were able to resist the drink. They were able to not have the desire to drink for the first time in a long time, in their whole life. They, they didn't have the desire to drink and stayed sober. And did other things, such as thinking of others. So 
the biggest thing in, in Alcoholics Anonymous is to learn how to stay sober, how to control our emotions, how to learn to act differently towards other people, and then carry that message to others. Again, help others. Think of others before we think of ourselves. And that cycle, going through that, of getting help from someone who came before you, giving help to someone who came after you, and continuing that over and over and over again is the basis of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then on the next page on 32, uh, Roman numeral 32, however, he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. He has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then, and he is a fine specimen of manhood as one could ever wish to meet. So this is the second gentleman that this doctor had met that changed and turned completely turned around. And then in the last paragraph, it says, I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through, and though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. The doctor crosses the line into spirituality, knowing that the real cure, the real treatment for alcoholics, alcoholism is a relationship with a power greater than yourself, a power that we pray to. And staying to pray will help you stay sober. And that's William D. Silkworth. So, Alcoholics Anonymous, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, really owe a tremendous amount to Dr. Silkworth. He wrote letters that are just amazing, and it's the first time that we got to understand what alcoholism is. We didn't know before. We listened to what other people said. We were bums. We were maladjusted to life. We just wanted to drink rather than be home with our families, or rather than be at work. We just wanted to drink instead. And it wasn't a choice. We didn't have a choice. When we were drunk, it wasn't because we had a choice. We had a choice on the first drink, but not after that. The doctor gave us that bit of information. And with that, Bill got sober. Bill got took this message to Bob Smith. Bob Smith got sober. And, and Bob had tried many other spiritual ways to get sober, but not the way Bill had explained it to him. And then he got sober with this spiritual approach that Bill had. And here we are, 80 some years later, we're all sitting in a room talking about this book and letting the message of this book help us all get sober, stay sober, and help other people get sober. Next week, we're going to start in chapter one, Bill's story, an excellent, excellent, excellent description of what an alcoholic is and how an alcoholic can recover. Bill started out with a couple of drinks before he went overseas to the war. Then he had a couple of drinks after that, a couple more drinks after that. He was introduced to alcohol when he was in his late teens, early 20s, went overseas, went to the war, came back at 22 and was still drinking and developed alcoholism. He wasn't an alcoholic in the beginning, but he developed the the you know, as his business went on, as he drank a little bit more, he developed to a point where he became an, a real alcoholic. We lived through his trials and tribulations, and then we see him recover in the story. And it's an excellent, excellent thing. We'll talk about that next week. Thank you all for listening. And back to you, Al.